Hello everyone and welcome to lecture number three uh, here in chapter three. Um, so in this one we're going to talk about amending the Constitution um, and the process um, that's set up so that you can actually amend or change slash add to the Constitution. It's a pretty straightforward lecture um, so let's dive in and get into the specifics. So to set the stage for you guys, our Constitution, one of the reasons why it's such an important document, um, not just for the United States, but really in the whole political realm of history, is that it is specifically designed to adapt with the times. And the amendment process and the amendments that follow out of that process are what allow it to adapt. And the amendment process is described specifically in Article 5 of the Constitution. That's really all that article is, is designed to talk about. Um, and amendments can deal with any exception or any subject except for that no state can lose its equal representation without its consent. And we'll talk about what that means more specifically um, when we get to um, other sections later on. But basically it just means that like here in the state of Michigan, you can't lose representation on a national level through an amendment unless the state of Michigan or whatever state you're dealing with says, no, we can we're fine with it. The state has to give consent. Um, and they can be proposed and ratified in two ways, and that's what we're gonna look at today. So, proposing amendments. Um, so the two, the two methods in, way, in, the, in terms of proposing them or putting them forth in, um, in Congress, the first one is you have a two-thirds vote from each House of Congress. So the House of Representatives has, has to have at least a two-thirds vote to pass it, and the Senate does as well and then it can to get it proposed. This has actually been the only method that's been used to date for an amendment to be proposed. And there are dozens of resolutions that are proposed each year. Obviously with only having 27 amendments, there are not very many that get even past the proposal process to be talked about on the floor. The second one is through national convention. In a national convention, um, if this process were to be used, you'd have to have two thirds of the states calling for a national convention to occur to propose um, so that amendments can be proposed at the convention. It's never occurred. There's been two instances where it actually has almost occurred, um, but it's never really occurred. And, and, and really, it's because of that third point there. It's a very controversial process because if you call the states together, enough of them come together, you have a national convention. Theoretically, there's not there isn't anything tied to a specific amendment or specific proposed amendment. So basically everything's up for grabs, um, including stuff that's already in the Constitution from an amendment standpoint. So it's very controversial because it could lead to the entire document being changed. And that's why it's, it's something that um, people really kind of frown upon using and why our government hasn't used it um, before. All right. So if you propose them, if they get proposed, then it goes to talking about them and then they need to be voted upon and ratified um, so that they actually can be added to the Constitution. So the two methods that are in place is you have a three-fourths approval by the states. Um, states vote upon them. If three-fourths of them, it gets three-fourths votes, then um, it can be ratified. Um, now, there have been instances where states have approved the amendments and then have remote revoked their ratification, which leads to them having an unknown decision. Um, but that's only occurred a few times. But don't, you don't have to worry about that bullet point, really. Just know three, four state approval um, for ratification. The second method is, again, you're using the same fraction, three, four ratification of approval, but you're, it's for a special ratifying convention. It's, it's kind of similar to the national convention, but it's each state at each state they come together and say okay let's let's talk about this and if, if three fourths votes add up on that then it can be ratified this has only happened one time and it happened um, to repeal um, prohibition so it repealed the 18th amendment and led to the 21st amendment that got rid of it um, and primarily the reason why this happened is because it was a special circumstance and the fact that all of the issues and problems that had developed because of prohibition, people were getting fed up with them and it needed, it, pretty much people were at the point where it needed to be called and there needed to be change. Um, and really what happens within this system, in this example, is you actually had delegates almost run their own special election campaign for this issue where you would actually have delegates that would run for or against 
the amendment and then they'd get elected to go and vote on it and then they would have a direct vote on this. And guys, this is just a graphic here um, going over what we just talked about on the previous two slides. You actually have two graphics. Um, I gave you both, so you had one had a little bit more information on the left um, than on the right. Um, be familiar with this because it'll help you um, in everything that we do in talking about amendments in the Constitution, but your guided reading specifically kind of talks about as a, a section that really is essentially this um, graphic. All right, so just a few few more here in terms of it, it changes um, in adjusting the Constitution with the amendment process. So amendments, there's only been 27, um, and they're the main like big form of change or addition to the Constitution, but there are actually informal changes that happen to the Constitution all the time. And it's they're informal because they're not directly linked to the doc. They're not directly added to the document. There are laws and provisions that are passed in other forms um, that help spell out the details of the Constitution itself. So, like for example, in Article One, one of the big pro one of the big powers of our legislative branches they can levy taxes. Well. How do you spell out, how do you do that? How are they going to do that in terms of levying the taxes? Well, there are complete sets of tax laws that have been created over time that help actually explain that um, specific power they have. Um, Article 2, the development and creation of cabinets and departments and agencies through by the executive branch have helped spell spelled out those powers as well, specifically in that instance for the president and the rest of the executive branch. In Article 3, the creation of the judicial branch when it was created in 1789 and how it's expanded as our nation has has changed and is going to change helps spell out what the court is in itself doing. And then there's other powers that are that are laid out throughout the Constitution that have been helped as well. Pretty much everything has been uh, helped through informal changes and spelling out of uh, laws and precedent and actions. All right, so there have been some changes um, set up because of the specifically with the presidency. Um, you have presidential succession was laid out specifically in the 20, uh, 25th Amendment um, to help clarify the succession lines um, in terms of if something were to happen, um, obviously past the vice president and so forth, they have, it's much clearer. Um, the question there is who is the first president to die in office? You got his picture there up on the, on the top. You guys don't know, it's William Henry Harrison. <laughs> Um, you also have presidential changes within or addressing the Constitution in terms of foreign affairs, um, where presidents will use executive agreements more often than direct treaties with nations. And this isn't necessarily a direct change to the Constitution. It's kind of a, a way around certain positions. And it kind of links to that question of why would presidents use executive agreements more often than treaties with nations. It's because they don't need Senate approval with executive agreements. So it's a way to kind of move things forward more quickly in, in most instances. Um, and that's not to say that presidents don't use treaties. They do that all the time. It's just executive agreements are allowed. Um, they're, they're a little bit faster. And it's a way to kind of help the president kind of change interpretations and, and, and do what he needs to do. Um, the last one here, domestic affairs, uh, requesting legislation rather than carrying out initiated laws. Um, so basically what this is, is this links into the president um, and their agenda, usually. If there's something they, they want to get done, um, they might look at the laws that are in place um, and I'm not saying not enforce them, um, but rather focus on a program that might circumvent them to get to what they want. So like carrying out a program, like let's say President Trump wanted to um, change laws specifically for like ending, you know, the, the, the um, problem that we're having with drugs, opioids in this country, and he doesn't like the, the laws that are in place, he would be requesting and putting through and, and using Congress as well to kind of say, hey, look, let's try to get legislation on this whether it's an amendment or direct laws to change what are already initiated, let's do that. That would be an example. 
um, and so forth. All right, just two more here. So court's decisions, um, the court really has the, the greatest effect in terms of changing the Constitution indirectly um, because of interpretation. The court's position is that they're supposed to use the laws that are there, but they need to interpret them in the way that they best see fit at that time. And it's because of the vague wording of the Constitution that it's up to, it's up to be open to interpretation. And that tool of judicial review where they can look at the laws of this country and the amendments and, and the, all the Constitution and all that stuff and see if they're constitutional or not is the most important thing. And this is where it leads to two specific terms that are linked with how our court acts um, at specific times. You have courts that can practice what is known as judicial restraint and judicial activism. And basically what that means is that from a restraint standpoint, that's a court, whether it's the Supreme Court, federal court, um, even state courts and local courts that try to avoid the initiative or avoid change and really just uphold what's there. Whether it's a state law, federal law, something directly in the Constitution. Then you have courts that practice what is known as judicial activism, where they are actively participating and trying to shape national policy. So they're playing they're playing more of a uh, of an active role in shaping what's what's to come. Whether it's in the cases they uh, mostly with it's in the cases they they decide on, or in their maybe getting out and um, saying stuff about specific movement or specific issue. But it's generally obviously through the cases. And what like an example of this is you have Chief Justice Earl Warren here um, during his time as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was fairly active in helping pass laws and um, um, issuing and uh, um, giving opinions on cases that actively shaped um, what was going on, whether it was Brown versus the Board of Education, um, the Civil Rights Act of 19, in, the, in the 1960s, and so forth, um, Voting Rights Acts in the 1960s, um, they played a role. And they can rule that the Constitution can rule one thing at one time and then later on rule have another ruling. And the best example of this, and I would write this down, is how the Supreme Court in 1896 ruled that Plessy versus Ferguson, the ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson that separate but equal could be established was a ruling by the Supreme Court. And then in 1954, in Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, the Supreme Court ruled that separate but equal was illegal. So they can rule at one time one way and then change it in the other because that's it's a different interpretation. There's different times, different actions that are going on. And that's that's part of, of what courts um, what, what courts can do in their power. All right, last slide here. Um, basically, too, there's been changes to our Constitution just through customs and usage. Our Constitution has grown and developed over time as we figured things out, whether it was as a new government, whether it was through um, times of, of uh, prosperity or times of heartache or, or like the Depression or like the Civil War or or what have you, there's been things that have developed because of just action, things that we do. Um, now, political parties are not stated within the Constitution, but as we know, we have a political party system. They've changed um, at various times throughout our history, whether it was the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, and Whigs and Democrats, Republic, you know, there's all these different um, parties that have developed. And then many amendments that have been in place have come through practice and precedent. Um, so like you have to think about in terms of, well, what rulings have had taken place and why did certain ones come into, come into effect? Going back to the 18th Amendment that established prohibition, well, why did that come into, uh, why did that come into a reason? Why did that movement lead, become so powerful and lead to a prohibition of alcohol? And then adding on top of that, well, what happened led to, what practices led to the 21st Amendment being needed to be added to repeal the 18th? would be an example, okay? All right, all right guys, that's all I got for you here. Um, I'll see you guys in the next lecture. It's gonna be an extension of this amendment. 
um, one, but in specifically, we're just going to talk all about the amendments themselves. So, all right, guys, I'll see you in the next one.